Good morning. Good to see you. Hopefully everyone is doing well this morning. Uh, We're going to be studying in Matthew 22 this morning. If you want to get out your Bibles and be turning to Matthew 22. So good to see you here. Uh, We do have visitors here. We want you to know that you are our special guests, and we very much appreciate you being here with us this morning. Uh, Hopefully you have gotten a lot out of our worship together thus far. Uh, Now's the portion when we take a deep look into God's Word and study to know uh, more about what Jesus teaches us in the Gospel of Matthew. We've been working our way through this book for quite a long time, and I'm not going to try to... uh, make up for lost time and tell you everything that's been talked about. We're just going to be studying uh, this morning from this text and try to understand it. I'll give you a little bit of context, uh, and I think you'll get a lot of value out of it. Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he has been questioned by the religious leaders over and over again. Uh, And we're going to be looking at another question that Jesus has asked this morning. Uh, So, First of all, I want to think about and prepare us for what we're going to be studying. What does God want from us? Think about that. And think about what a lot of people would say in the world around us that God really wants from us. A lot of people have a lot of different ideas about what God wants, don't they? I mean, uh, here's just a few that I, I'm thinking about the world and the messages that are in movies and TV and, and messages and statements that I hear from people all around me. Um, be true to yourself. You, know, you ever hear that? That's what God wants. He wants you to be true to you and to be who you are. Uh, that's very common today. Um, some people might say God just wants us to be a good person. Uh, And some people might say, well, God just wants us to enjoy our lives. He gave it to us to be enjoyed, and so we need to seize the day and make the most of the life that that God has given us and enjoy it to the fullest. And some people might say we need to love people, and we need to be faithful, faithful to our friends, faithful to our family, uh, not have that evil of betraying people, uh, and that's what they value most, and that's what they think God values most. When you look at these, these are all pretty good attempts, but uh, where do all of these ideas come from? Do they not just come from men's thinking? (laughs) I mean, it's all just coming out of men's thoughts, men's ideas, men's notions of what is good and and what what they've heard before that sounds good to them. And that's how they decide and discern what is pleasing to God is whatever I hear from someone else that sounds good to me, that's what I'm going to take in as being the truth about what God really wants. How does that work whenever uh, we want to know what each other wants? We just listen to everybody else tell us what, what someone wants. Is that how that works? It doesn't work like that. But that's how we think it works with God. And then you'll go to the more religious people and maybe ask them, what does God want? And you'll hear all kinds of different statements from even religious people who are maybe studying the Bible. Uh, God really wants you to go to church. Or God really wants you to stop lying, stop drinking, stop dressing immodestly, uh, stop doing this, doing that. Just, just this huge list of um, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And maybe if a huge list of good things. Do this and do this and do this and do this. Read your Bible. Pray. This is what God wants from you. And this is the message that we hear a lot of times from the religious world. And again, these are all really good attempts, right? Uh, but they're failing to hit the mark. Um, why is this not enough? Is this, is this not enough to do all these things? Is this not enough? Why, why not? Why isn't it enough? Uh, I want you to be thinking about that as we study through the text this morning. Let's start by reading the text. In Matthew 22, if you're there with me, verse 34 says, But when the Pharisees heard that he, Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. This is our text for this morning and for next week because these are the greatest commandments. Why not spend two weeks discussing them? Uh, and, and as we read through this, we see that the Pharisees bring a question to Jesus. Now you're like, who are these Pharisees? Who are the Sadducees? You've been here, you know. Pharisees are the religious leaders who would teach the law, and they were very conservative. And the Sadducees, it seems, were a little bit more on the liberal side. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They had just questioned Jesus about that in the previous text. But these Pharisees are very religious people, and they love the law. And they're all about teaching the law to everybody and helping everybody understand what God wants. In fact, they've written books in addition to the law to help everybody understand and do the things that God wants them to do. And one of them is called a lawyer. It's not like a lawyer that we have today that just deals with uh, social uh, injustices and things like that. This is a lawyer who is in touch with the, the spiritual law that God has given them and handed down to them from of old. Uh, the law and the prophets, the, the Bible, their Bible was the Old Testament. Uh, and this is a man who knows that, that Bible. He understands it, and now he is coming to Jesus to ask him a question and his question is, which command is the greatest? From the outside, that kind of seems like a really good question. Uh, we probably want to know which command is the greatest. I mean, that, that sounds pretty good to us. But consider that this is a controversial question. Now, why, why would I say that? Why is this controversial. Well, it's controversial for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons this is controversial is because Jesus has not been lining up with all that the Pharisees do and teach. They're the, they're the rulers of the law. They're the ones who teach the law. And Jesus has been spending his time with sinners. He spends his time with uh, tax collectors and prostitutes. These are the, the lowest of the low in Jerusalem and Judah. And Jesus is spending time with them. These are the biggest sinners. These are the biggest lawbreakers. And so as they come to him asking them this question, uh, they're expecting to understand a little bit and, and drive a wedge, kind of like the, the Sadducees last week, drive a wedge between him and the rest of the people as he shows he values one commandment above another commandment. And by doing that, he, they're going to be able to turn everybody against him. Oh, look at Jesus. He values that commandment. We are more righteous than Jesus. We value these commandments. And really, they're asking the question, do you value the commandments or not? They're trying to get to the root of that and understand that better. As, they say, as he says, I think this is the greatest commandment. Uh, you know, give to the poor. Uh, then they, they're going to say, well, why don't you think you should be holy? Like God is holy. Why don't you think all these things? Uh, and, and why aren't you giving your money to God? Why are you giving it to the poor? So they're just trying to drive a wedge between Jesus and the people. They're trying to, to create some bickering and fighting, and they're trying to categorize him so that he has less influence over the people. Because these guys like the influence that they've had in the past, and they're losing it to Jesus. He has become the most influential one in all of Jerusalem. So they ask this question, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And you see that there's something wrong with this question from the beginning. What's wrong with it? How do you determine what the greatest commandment of the law is? Do you determine that by asking someone what the greatest commandment of the law is? And, and why do you want to determine the greatest commandment of the law? Is it not so that you can reduce the law and make it less so that it's more manageable and so that it's more easy for you to accomplish? There's a lot of problems with this law. Or with this question. Uh, but, but he comes to them, they come to him with this question, and they're, they're noticing this is going to be a controversial question. Everybody's going to be disagreeing about the answer to this question. So there's no win situation 
for Jesus? What's he going to answer? Have you ever asked yourself a similar question? Have you ever tried to reduce the law to just a few things and say, as long as I do these things, I'm pleasing to God. This is what God really wants me to do as long as I go to church, as long as I read my Bible and pray. Maybe you don't put that one on the list because that's kind of taking up some time. So then we'll just reduce it even further. As long as I go to church, I'm okay. You know, do we do this? Do we, do we try to come up with what's the greatest commandment? What does God really want from me? And reduce it down to one thing. And Jesus answers the question in the most beautiful way. He says, the one thing. You want to reduce it down to one thing. The one thing is, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he says, the second is like it. Love God your neighbor as yourself. And then he says something really amazing. On these two depend all the law and prophets. Jesus doesn't just give them one command to focus on so that they can ignore all the rest. (laughs) Jesus gives them one command to focus on so that they'll be more focused on all the rest. He says, on these two commands hang or depend all the law and the prophets. You go through the Old Testament, you'll find 613 laws according to the Jews. And Jesus says here, all of those laws depend on these two commands. Isn't this amazing? I mean, think about this for a second. Think about the implications of what he's just said. How is it that all the law and prophets depend on these two commandments? He's saying every single one of those 613 laws are based upon God's desire for man to love him and to love one another. As we read through the Old Testament and we see law after law after law after law, why is he giving them? Jesus tells us the answer. So that we'd love him more. He just gives us all these laws so that we would learn to actually love him as we should. He gives us all these laws so that we would learn to actually love one another as we should. So really, as Jesus sees the fault in the question, he doesn't you know, point that out to them. He just resets the question and, and he answers it with an understanding of the fault that's in it. The greatest commandment is not, you shall not murder. The greatest commandment is, you shall love God so much that you would never even think of harming someone who is made in his image and someone whom he loves. You should love your neighbor so much that you would never even think of being angry toward your neighbor. You see how it works. It's every single thing is dependent on these two laws. And so this is why we're going to spend some extra time on this text. And today we're going to talk about loving God. And and next week, Lord willing, we're going to talk about loving our neighbor so that we really truly grasp these concepts and make sure we're keeping these commands. This is rule number one in our lives. If you've been looking for the one commandment that you must do in order to please God, we're talking about that this morning. And there's another thing that you also must do to please God. And we're talking about that next week. So if you can't be here, listen in online and make sure you catch that and make sure you study this for yourself to make sure you're in keeping with it. So let's ask ourselves the question, do we love God? I think there's a lot of different answers that we might give to that. Uh, Some of the more bold of us would say, well, of course I do. Let's move on. Of course I love God. Let's move on to the next idea, the next law to keep. Uh, I don't want to focus on this one. Uh, Of course I love God. But if we're honest, we might ask the question, what does that mean exactly? I'm not sure if I love God. And if we're humble (laughs) and we see in ourselves the battle of different passions inside of us, the, neg- the negligence that we've had toward God, we might say, I've not loved God as I should, but I want to. And that's the goal, is for us to understand 
if we don't love God as we should, we must and understand how we can possibly do this. The message of this whole section and this whole command is, if God is not our number one passion in life, we're failing at the most important thing God has given us to do. Let that sink in for a minute. Is God our number one passion in life? And if he's not, we're failing at the most important thing. Why is this such a hard thing for us to do? As as, as that that question sinks in, it's just, oh, man. (sighs) Number one passion all the time. It's hard. And the reason why it's hard is because we tend to love ourselves like this. To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, that means everything inside of you loves Him and wants to please Him and wants to serve Him and wants to glorify Him. And and the truth is, inside of me is a battle between the desire to love God and the desire to love and serve myself. I tend to think more of myself than I tend to think of God. I don't think of God as much as I should. I neglect God uh, because of the things that are before me and the life that is before me seems to be all about me. I think more about myself than I think about him. And I think he's trying to help us understand the message of all the Old Testament, the message of of all the law and all the Bible is God is trying to create inside of us a love and a passion for God that is so deep that it overpowers the love that we feel for ourselves. How do you love God like this? How do you love God like this? And what does this mean? To love God with all your heart, soul, and mind? You know, there was a time whenever I would read uh, John 14, 15 and think, well, to love God means to keep his commandments. And so I just need to keep all these commandments. I need to go to church. I need to stop lying. I need to stop doing this. I need to stop doing that. And that shows that I love God. And I love God because I keep his commandments. Is that what it means to love God? That we keep his commandments? No, if you look at John 14, 15 closely, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Notice there's a, there's a, a difference in order there. <laughs> Not if you keep my commandments, you love me, but if you do love me, then of course you will keep my commandments. We do the commandments if we love him already. So loving God is not just making the checklist of the 613 or whatever many laws that we find throughout Scripture and checking them all off, and then we can say at the end of it, there, I'm done. I've loved God as I should, and now I need to get off to the more important things that I really love. It's not the way it works. It's not what it means to love God. And this this is common sense to us, isn't it? I mean, think about your spouse. If your spouse makes you a honey do list, and, and, and a list of things that, that, you, that she would like and that she enjoys. And, and you go through and you just check them all off as fast as you can so that you can go off and play golf, so that you can go off and play video games, so you can go off and do, watch football or do whatever you want to do. And you just, you're just checking them off. And, and one of them is, I love you. And you say, oh, I love you. And then you just keep going. Have you loved your spouse? That's not ever what it was about, is it? That's not what it was about. It was about taking care of business, getting it done, so I can get on to the more important things that really matter to me most. So now, do you love God? Or is 
your relationship with God more like just checking off a bunch of things so that I can say that I love God because I did things that he told me to do, and then I can get back to the things that I really love. See, that's the problem. I hear a lot of people sometimes say, and sometimes even in my children say, do we have to go to church? Do we have to go to Bible study? No, we don't have to. You don't have to. But do you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with your mind? If you don't want to build up the body of Christ, if you don't want to worship God, you don't want to learn about him, you don't want to serve him, can we really say we love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind? God doesn't want spiritual adultery. He doesn't want us to say that we love him, to enter into a relationship with him, and then have passions and desires for the things of this world. It's okay to enjoy the things in this world, and I'm not, I'm not you know, completely saying you must never enjoy anything ever for the rest of your life. You must be in this church building 24-7. But that cannot be your passion. And there's a difference between enjoying golf, enjoying football, enjoying shopping, and it being my passion. There's a difference between, uh, well, I was going to go to church, and I got sick, and I I couldn't make it. And, well, I was going to go to church, but there's this opportunity that popped up where I could go play golf with somebody at a really cool course. You see, there's a difference between the two things. And, And God is trying to help us understand He's not after the checkbox of coming to church. He's after the heart that wants to be here. That's what he jealously yearns for. He's longing for it. He's reaching out, trying to get it from all of us. What's the solution? How are we going to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind? Maybe we need a checklist to to, to get us into good habits, okay? But the checklist can't be founded in, this is what's going to show my love for God. The checklist has to be the means by which we get to a greater love for God. And really... The solution is a denial of self. So make that checklist huge so, and, and let those things that you've loved instead of God fall by the wayside so that you can focus on what is most important. Because we need to come to the realization, as God is teaching us over and over again in his word, that if we love ourself and if we love this world, The satisfaction will be temporary, and the end result will be emptiness. And we must come to that understanding in ourselves and deny ourselves and the things that we enjoy so much in order to serve God even more. And I'm not saying just wipe it all out and never do anything fun again. Again, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the priority is to worship and serve and love God. The priority is not to enjoy my my own stuff, my own time, my own recreational activities, whatever, my own sleep. (laughs) It's not the priority. And second, we see that in order to love God, we need to know him. You know, we have to deny ourselves and deny all these things, but then we have to devote ourselves to studying his word. God is not difficult to love. I was just recently studying with somebody, and I could just tell a light bulb has gone off in his mind. (laughs) Studying is actually really cool. There's actually a lot in here that I'm learning about God. And I didn't even think I could learn all this, but I'm learning all this about God. And it's so deep. And he's like, I spent six hours on one chapter. I was like, yeah, it's really good, isn't it? It's better than ice cream. 
Think about the psalmist who said, oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. He's meditating on it. It's sweeter than honey to my soul. We must learn to love the study of the Bible because in it we find a greater understanding of the God who loves us enough to give his son to die for us. Who, who stepped out in love for a people who are evil and show tremendous care and promises of blessings that they don't deserve. We learn about this, and we don't just learn about it externally or superficially. We learn about it, and it changes what's inside of us so that we truly love and have a passion for God. And the result is we glorify him. We glorify him. He's the reason behind everything we do and everything we enjoy. If I do go play golf, then I'm thinking about how I can use that to glorify him. I, I mean, golf kind of lost its luster for me. It's not as much fun for me. I'd rather be here. I'd rather be with you guys. I'd rather be singing and studying the Bible than doing that. But if I'm going to have to do it, then I'm going to try to use it to his glory. I'm going to do it with people I can influence and help and encourage and, hey, I might have a little fun every now and then, and that's okay. But it's not about me. And it's, nothing's about me. I enjoy all kinds of things, and I enjoy them with other people, but it's not about me. It has to be about him. So in summary, God does not want a checklist. That's not why we're here to check things off. He wants our hearts, and then he wants obedience flowing out of the heart that loves him. The most important thing we can do in life is love God passionately. It's the most important thing we can do. And if you're struggling with that, join us as we all struggle together. Let go of yourself. Pick up your Bibles and learn about the wonderful God we serve. You'll fall in love with him over and over and over again as you learn who he is. This is good food right here, and we can enjoy it, and that's what we're here for. If you're here this morning and you've not uh, received the blessing that God offers to you, his son has died so that you can live with him forever. He just loves you because he wants to love you. In spite of all your weaknesses, in spite of all your flaws, in spite of all the, the failures that you have in your life, God wants your heart and he wants to love you and he wants you to love him in return. And everything he has done since the beginning of time has been to draw you in to a relationship with him that will be eternal. So the question is for each and every one of us, do we love God? And are we willing to show that love by turning away from evil, by being transformed, by having a renewed mind, and submitting our wills to his? If there's anything that we can do to help you this morning, will you please come as we stand and as we sing?